So welcome. It's the next episode of Building the Open Web Podcast today. We have Sergey Nazarov from Chainlink today. Thank you for coming. Great. Thank you for having me, Sasha. Good to be here. Cool. So maybe we can start a little bit with the background into how did you get into the blockchain space and why? Well, how, how I got into blockchains was, was back in 2011 with actually mining. And at that time, I didn't really understand the difference between cryptocurrency and digital goods and digital currencies. And it was just something I came to actually through my interest in digital goods and digital currencies and gaming. And there was a large community of people back then that were actually mining on their homemade GPUs. And I, I heard about it through this kind of digital goods, digital currency gaming angle. At first, I didn't really understand what it was about. And there was a lot of a lot of misinformation and confused information. And it, it initially looked like just another digital currency from, a, from, from the gaming world or some kind of digital good. But then when you actually dig into it and you look at what it's about, I think the first thing that grabbed me as particularly unique was actually two things. So the, the first thing was that I knew already from the history of, of digital currencies that you had an issue of companies attached to the digital currency going out of business. And if that company goes out of business, if it stops operating, then the digital good, the digital currency loses all value. And this created a significant risk in people's adoption of digital goods, right? Because you're putting either time into uh, acquiring a digital good in a game or you're turning points, flying points into, into something, but you're basically spending resources to acquire some digital good or digital currency. And then you have business risk, right? So you're, you as a user actually have business risk because if the centralized company around the digital currency doesn't exist any longer, all the resources you put into that are gone. And you see this in gaming, you see this in various digital goods, you see this in loyalty points, you see this all. And, and I, knew, I knew about that problem. And when I looked at Bitcoin and I realized that it actually, Bitcoin, there was no Bitcoin company. So there wasn't a company that had to exist for Bitcoin to continue. So that was the first unique property that was quite fascinating to me, that you didn't have to rely on the existence of a corporate entity or a company for, for some digital good to continue to exist. And that was truly unique as far as people's reasoning for putting value or resources into acquiring that digital good. So that, that, was, that was amazing to me. The, the second thing that was very impressive once I started mining more and I started really thinking about what, what was happening in the context of mining was that you know throughout history, whenever you wanted to, to generate revenue or get, get paid to do something, you would have to do a deal, right? You would have to do a deal to go get wheat. You would have a mill. You would turn it into flour. You would have to go get cotton. You would have a textile factory. You would turn it into you know, cloth or clothing. And you would have to do all these deals, basically. I, I couldn't really think of a single time in history where somebody could turn on a machine and the machine would give them something of value. And that was a pretty pretty unique thing as far as I could tell. I literally because every other every other situation I could think about, you had to go and coordinate a lot of other people and resources around your enterprise. And then your enterprise had to turn one group of resources into another group of resources that had greater value. But with Bitcoin, you, you, you as a miner, you turn on a computer, you contribute to the security or the existence of something that, that can, in theory, exist for hundreds, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, and you get something of value in return without having to acquire any, you know, do any deals. And so I, I kind of did that for a little bit of time, and then I switched to some other tokens that had less difficulty but then eventually, eventually that, that all became really, really competitive and it became a capital expensive undertaking and you know, it was kind of just an interesting thing I was doing. And so I, I, the point at which I actually got into building something around blockchains was, was later around when you had the appearance of something called app coins. And app coins were the first protocols that did something other than Bitcoin. And, and, and you actually had functionality built into a blockchain and that blockchain was considered an app and you you, you the thesis was you were going to have all these blockchains and they were going to be on an app by app basis so you're going to have a blockchain and it's going to be like a messaging blockchain for the messaging app use case and it's going to have its own single messaging app and it's just going to do that one thing so pe people just wanted to go down the path of bitcoin and say you know i have a single chain 
with a single app use case. And that was around 2013 and 14, around, around those years. The first dynamic that I looked at in, in that space was actually trying to reason about what transactions could you put onto a blockchain that were not about payments. So I, I saw these folks building different blockchains and saying that different blockchains were going to be used to make these specific individual app use cases. And I had a feeling that that maybe wasn't exactly right and was going to evolve from there. And the more important question was, like the fundamental question was, is there a capacity to use blockchains for data other than payments data? So that, that was the, the, the big question that I had at the time. In order to answer that question, we built something called CryptoMail. CryptoMail was, as, as far as we could tell, the first block, successful blockchain-based messaging service where the message text never ended up touching a central server. So you never had an encrypted version of the text sitting in some centralized server for that encrypted version of the text to be served to a client somewhere. There was actually blockchains back then that could have as much as 40 kilobytes of arbitrary data in a, in a single transaction. So that's a few paragraphs of plain text. And we were able to make an interface where you could encrypt plain text client side. So the user on their browser could encrypt the text and they could put that encrypted text into this blockchain infrastructure, which was separately run from any centralized point. And part of the reason for this was that this was in a period when private messaging services were very attractive and in demand. And part of it was because I actually, I really wanted to know if, if you could actually do this. I, I, I actually had very, I had serious doubts, but I thought that it was still worthwhile to see if, if that's possible, because I knew that if that was possible, then this category of data and this category of transactions would suddenly acquire this tamper-proof, decentralized, immutable kind of long-term existence property, which I, I knew what was an attractive property for secure messaging systems. So we successfully built that and, and it worked. The issue there was actually that the market was a little bit um, worrying. There were a number of people that started contacting us for secure messaging capabilities that uh, seemed kind of worrying to me. And we didn't necessarily want to build a, a product around catering to some of the people that ended up getting in touch with us to, to use that. So it was basically a beta and, and we had it working and it worked very well. It actually achieved what a lot of centralized, centrally run secure messaging systems could not achieve. And that really proved out the, the quality of the, of the infrastructure to me. Then the next logical question was, what other types of data and other categories of transactions can be placed in this infrastructure? And what are the highest value categories? Uh, and that's really when we started thinking deeper and deeper about how do we properly put trading data, various ownership data, and then we, we pretty quickly arrived at smart contracts as, as the very logical final outcome of this industry, where you you have a redefinition of digital agreements in this blockchain-based format. And as, as limited as the infrastructure was back in the year 2014 and 15, uh, you could still see people taking certain smart contracts around decentralized exchange, around generating new forms of ownership, and putting them on these blockchains and giving people guarantees that those pieces of data, those transaction types were tamper-proof. And, and that's really when I got hooked in completely into the idea that this entire space, that this space could become the dominant kind of form of digital agreement for all digital agreement of, of all types. Because if you actually ask somebody the question, would you like a highly reliable contract that's going to definitely execute as written and give you what, what you're owed in the case of basically any category of contracts? Or would you like some contract with a lot of counterparty risk and with a high likelihood of failure in certain extreme situations. No, no rational actor is going to choose the more risky contract that could screw them over, basically. And this is, uh, this is the, the very logical idea that I have yet to hear anybody explain to me why that's not the case. And if that's the case, well, why wouldn't all the contracts on the planet, at least the ones in digital form, which is the vast majority of all contracts, now, thanks to the internet, why wouldn't all contracts operate in this manner? Well, they would, because why would I want a less reliable contract? It just it just doesn't make sense. Yep. And which which year was it when you came to this conclusion? I think this was 2014, 
2015, something, something like that. So I think this, I think this was right around the time when um, you saw the app coin thesis fall away, which was around for admittedly a brief time, and you saw people talk about start thinking about more generalized smart contract platforms. So I would say 2014 is approximately the year when um, when we started coming to the conclusion that in reality all of these contracts should uh, should be in this format. Mm-hmm. And how did you then come to the idea of kind of like the need for universally connected smart contracts? That's another very logical leap if you actually look at the the universe of contracts that you're trying to capture or you're trying to convert into smart contracts. Their properties, what they end up actually doing, what they need to do what they're meant to do, like what they need to operate properly and and the limitations of blockchain. So you, universally connected smart contracts are smart contracts that are connected to external systems. So a lot of a lot of people from the name smart contracts assume it goes with the normal kind of smart nomenclature around smart cards, smart cars, smart fridges, and, and, and all of these things are smart in the sense that they have connectivity to the internet. The naming of smart contracts as smart contracts, I personally really like it, but I, I, I think it creates a certain semantic confusion where people inherently assume that smart contracts are smart in the sense that they're inherently connected. And what they should really be called more, more accurately is highly tamper-proof digital agreements or censorship resistant digital agreements or something something like that because the the reality of smart contracts is that while they do run on a blockchain and that blockchain is run by independent miners that use the internet to communicate and come to consensus about things through you know various messaging layers you end up in a place where you've created a very tamper proof form of of contract state right of 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 a kind of a state machine to show the state of a of a specific stage in a contract's life but the security that you gained from creating that highly tamper-proof smart contract state then inherently created limitations about connectivity. So smart contracts, despite being called smart contracts, are not connected to external data. And from our experience building these smart contracts, we basically realized that every smart contract that we wanted to build that was actually advanced in doing something of of well, not the only ones that do value, but the, the 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 ones that we were trying to build in relation to global shipping, or uh, something in the financial markets with banks, or or something in the insurance industry to provide insurance to the geographies where they don't have them because the legal system doesn't allow insurance to work properly. You consistently saw that you needed external data, and so universally connected smart contracts were were the ones that we were actually always building. So for many years, we were I guess five years, four or five years. I mean, maybe even more, I guess, closer to seven now. So we, I mean, we, we were building these, these advanced smart contracts in various formats for many, many years. And, and basically what, what you arrive at is the realization that if they weren't connected to the proof that were, was able to show them what was happening, you would be stuck with making two types of contracts. You would be making contracts about tokens and uh, moving, movement of tokens to, to different private keys. And you would be having private key voting. And the reason for that is because private keys are baked into the system and tokens are baked into the system from, from the time that you start using it, partly because private keys are at the core of the system and, and because tokens are related to making the infrastructure operate. And those use cases are important and they're very exciting in the sense that they do provide value into our, into our blockchain ecosystem that then gets put into more advanced smart contracts. But we, we kind of just realized that from the fact that we were building so many of these, and we realized that all the ones that we were building that weren't about token generation or ownership or voting necessarily had to have this universally connected Oracle capability, which is what we focus on now. Mm-hmm. And since you started kind of down on this journey, how did the state of this kind of like segment of the market change as it relates to getting data from external sources, being able to connect it back to whatever people want to do with smart contracts? Yeah, so I think I think the way that that it's evolved is that as the value secured by oracles increased, people's requirements for what makes a good oracle also increased. Early on, you see it, you saw a number of people actually like us when we started building a centralized oracle in the format of what what operated in the background in smartcontract.com. You saw people kind of try to make a centralized oracle mechanism because everybody's focus was on the smart contract state. 
And the assumption was, as long as you can have the smart contract stay do something, you're completely safe. You're set as far as security goes. And that's, that's, I think that's the first faulty assumption that started to fall away, especially for people as, that worked more and more with smart contracts. So there was a class of people that didn't work with oracles or, or data-enabled kind of universities connected smart contracts at all. And they focused on generating tokens and making voting infrastructure through DAOs or some other thing like that. And that was great and was innovation for the space and it moved, moved things forward. Then there were people that wanted to build these more advanced smart contracts in the forms of insurance or decentralized financial products. And they would either bake their own Oracle that they ran as a team, or they would use some kind of centralized web service that offered Oracle as a service, both of which are, are highly, highly flawed. And there was a period when people were saying, you know, literally saying, no, it's fine. I'll run my own Oracle. No, it's fine. I'll use a centralized service to be the Oracle. And uh, that, that never really made sense to us. So after, after doing that for a little bit of time, we kind of came to the conclusion that you need to extend the decentralized computational guarantees around smart contract state into the guarantees about the real world. So you need to create definitive truth about external events. And the definitive truth that you create needs to meet the same high standard as the definitive truth created by a blockchain about smart contract state. So, so that's, that's really the conclusion that we came to. And then as you start really unpacking the problem, you start to see a number of layers to the problem. There's a, a layer around data quality. There's a layer around guaranteeing that data is going to be delivered to the Oracle mechanism. There's a layer around guaranteeing that the data is going to be properly validated by multiple independent nodes, which basically means you need to create a new form of decentralized computation Focus specifically on data delivery and validation. Then you need guarantees that the data will actually make its way into the contract. And then uh, in an ideal world, you need privacy properties in the contract to make sure that the data you put in there can't be misused or stolen or manipulated uh, or, or used to do something against the contract. So at the end of the day, you have these kind of uh, really multifaceted considerations. Right now, the space is in a place where people have uh, holistically abandoned the idea of running their own Oracle, partly because some people had failures and they, and they had issues that they wanted to get away from as quickly as possible. All those folks basically went on to use our system because once they evaluated, they saw that we've architected the system with all these different categories of risk in mind. And then you see some people who, well, you see two other things. You see some people who are trying to make an, an Oracle mechanism out of a web service. So they had a web service and they were or they have experience making web services and, they, and they're creating a web service that they're continually trying to add a Band-Aid onto, right? So they're trying to take their web service that was a centralized Oracle and they're trying to create many more services around it to reduce risk, or they're trying to create some architecture that creates some collection of services that interoperates some way that they hope is secure. But what they're really trying to do is take a, a, a web service that they had and kind of slowly decentralize it, put a Band-Aid on it. What, what we did was we started with a completely clean slate, working with uh, world-leading academics like Ari Jules, who was the previous chief scientist of RSA and uh, formalized proof of work in the 90s, the same proof of work used by Bitcoin, and then invented proof of retrievability um, during his time at RSA. And so together with him, we made the initial uh, version of the Chainlink system, which starts on the foundational assumption of decentralized computation being applied to oracles. In addition to people like trying to make a web service instead of starting at a foundational place of let's actually solve this problem in all its different risks and facets. And by the way, that approach of making a web service a slightly better Oracle is, is, is going to fail because there's a number of considerations that aren't made when you start from that, that, that starting point. Then the second category of what I see how people are approaching this problem is they're trying to take a blockchain and turn it into an Oracle. Both of these approaches are very, very flawed because they begin from fundamentally wrong assumptions. They begin from the idea that um, a decentralized Oracle network is either a web service that needs to be uh, added to incrementally and that we can just turn a web service into a piece of decentralized infrastructure, or uh, a decentralized Oracle is a blockchain with the word Oracle attached to it, and maybe we'll just connect some APIs and hope for the best. So the, the, the state of universally connected smart contracts right now, I would say, is that there's more and more people building them, specifically in DeFi. I think there's going to be much more in decentralized insurance as well. And then also fraud-proof gaming, I consider these universally connected smart contracts because they need to connect to either sports data 
or, or randomness, for which we have something called Chainlink VRF. But I, I think that there are still a number of assumptions out there in the space, similar to the assumptions that people were making before about centralized oracles. Uh, they're just taking a different format, uh, where people are, 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 are trying to add the word decentralization to an oracle mechanism that doesn't actually provide data quality, proofs of the origin, um, validation by high quality node operators, guarantees about data delivery. Uh, some of these some of these Oracle systems don't have any economic incentives to operate properly at all, uh, which which I think is quite strange because every decentralized computational system out there has incentives for independent participants to build infrastructure through running it, right? So you have an incentive to be a miner, to be an independent node operator. And so I, I think there's now a new crop of ideas around how an Oracle should work, which begin at faulty starting points. But luckily for us, we started out at a very foundational starting point of solving solving data delivery. Mm -hmm. And maybe also now that you mentioned the kind of like what's the current state of universally smart contracts, maybe you can also mention the current state of infrastructure overall, like layer ones, as it compares to like a couple of years back. I definitely think that layer ones are evolving and going on to solve significant problems that that are that are worth solving. So I, I think I think one of the top uh, problems that I see out there is scalability. So one of one of the top issues that layer ones are seeking to address right now is the ability for their systems to meet the scalability requirements not only of the smart contract landscape in its current state, but also of the many future use cases that plan to make their way onto such a system. I think this is where there's a lot of competition. Um, I think this is somewhere where near the product that you're working on has a lot of thoughtful work put into it and a lot of advances around how it, it handles scalability. There are a number of people working on this in the academic world, in the larger blockchain ecosystem. There's existing blockchains that have uh, reinventions of themselves that they that they seek to solve this problem for them. I think, generally speaking, scalability is, is a very valuable problem to solve. And I think the blockchain that's able to solve it in time for the influx of use cases that, that will come to use that scalability will, will have a very valuable place in this ecosystem. So I, I think scalability is an important property. The, the second property that I, I, I also see people innovating on, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different properties in, in layer ones that people are innovating on. I'm, I'm not as familiar with all of them. I'm, I'm familiar with the ones that relate to us, like scalability relates to us because it allows us to put more data on chain. So the more scalable environments will allow us to put more and more data onto them, which will make them data rich, which will enable people to build more accurate financial products and those types of things. So it's, it is really very relevant to us. The other dynamic that I see is, is people innovating on smart contract languages and the environments in which those contracts code is actually executed. Uh, I've seen people like, like you folks at NIR adopting an approach toward well-used languages like Rust for creating smart contracts with uh, a, the, the larger smart Rust community and, and running it in an environment that caters to the security dynamics of that language. I've seen a number of different folks approach uh, how to make both either a very usable language or an extremely secure language. And I've also seen people try to eliminate the need for security audits by applying for verification. So there's there's a number of different nuances around how to approach the issue of smart contract languages. We do have some experience with this because oracles fundamentally are represented by a smart contract on chain. And I, I think that uh, innovations in, in that are also going to be important because they're going to increase security. They're going to increase the capacity for people to more easily interact, not only with contract languages, but also with the contracts that they need to use in an ecosystem like an Oracle contract, which is which is part of what we would provide onto uh, an environment like NIR and, which, and, and who we're thrilled to be working with to provide high quality data for people to use in their smart contracts. Mm -hmm. And maybe looking into the future now with you working with NIR, some other folks out there, how do you think about like importance of oracles going forward as new use cases come online? I think that oracles are a very important complement to a layer one system because the layer one system, in my opinion, is used for certain specific things where it gets a unique benefit from its security. So you basically have a layer one system universe right now where people are 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 agreeing and converging on the idea that you need a la layer one that can 
create a golden source of truth, a single golden record between parties. It needs to be able to accept payment. It needs to be able to interact with private keys for payment and for voting. And it needs to be kind of the golden singular record that everybody interacts with. But everybody also agrees, and this is why we have so many blockchain uh, partners and dApps and DeFi applications using us, is that in addition to this golden record and this smart contract state being secure, you also need the connection with data and even some trust-minimized off-chain computation through systems like Arbitrum or, or various other roll-up schemes around how do you properly do the operations, the computations that can't be done in a blockchain? How do you do them in a trust-minimized manner so that they meet the high standards of a smart contract? And so we, we don't have a blockchain. So we don't, we don't have a chain of our own. We don't make decentralized financial products the way that our, our users do. Our entire goal is to be a complement both to the blockchain platforms that need all this data for people to build decentralized financial products in their, in their ecosystem, and very importantly, to the decentralized financial products themselves. And so I, I think what you actually see is two very important things. I, I think there's kind of two very important basic points. The first point is it's, it's not a coincidence that decentralized financial products, DeFi, is taking off at the same time that high quality decentralized Oracle mechanisms can deliver data and access to external proof about those contracts to a blockchain. So it's it's very related in my opinion that you you have the largest amount of financial data ever on public blockchains and you at the same time have the largest growth in decentralized financial products which inherently rely on that data. And then the thing that you see once you look at more decentralized financial products and you, you look at the, the teams and how their system actually works, is that in our case, we are, for example, enabling many of these teams to launch more and more markets, more and more financial products, because every incremental piece of data that we put on chain enables them to launch an additional product, enables them to launch an additional market. Conversely, if that data isn't on chain, they, they can't launch an additional product. So even now, what, what you're kind of seeing is the relationship between how high quality data that's reliable enough to, to trigger large amounts of value or, or have a, a, a smart contract relationship with large amounts of value because it's properly validated and it's, and it's coming from a decentralized computational system like a decentralized Oracle network. You basically see, you see the growth in DeFi going in parallel with the growth in data available to DeFi developers. So that's, I, th I think that's the second important point. So I, th I think a, a high quality Oracle mechanism that can provide all the data that DeFi developers fundamentally need in order to build their application, to, to even get it live at all, is a fundamental roadblock, which we are very excited to be eliminating successfully. And as we launch more and more data, I think you'll see more and more DeFi, more and more markets, both from our existing users and entirely new users. So we see, we see people working with us, uh, starting with us, in a number of weeks getting live. Some of them have launched even nine or 10 months ago and they have over 500 million secured in their system today. So this, this is protocols like Aave as an example. Other folks like Synthetics that we work with, we enable them to launch entirely new markets because now they have access to data. And I, I think oracles are gonna be very important initially on the delivery of data to make the universe of financial products on a blockchain so expansive that it's competitive with the traditional financial world. But then eventually, as the products become more advanced, like what you see from certain teams like DMM, then you, you'll see people wanting to have their Oracle mechanism provide a form of trust-minimized off-chain computation that isn't about creating a blockchain, but it's about appending and adding more proof and more data to a blockchain's smart contract record. Yep. Makes a lot of sense. And if you think about DeFi as an industry, it feels like it's very early days. And how, how do you think that one will evolve in terms of the categories of use cases and which ones will be reliant the most on oracles as well? Well, I think the very important thing is that everything except the creation of a token and the voting with a private key that happens on blockchains today is reliant on an oracle. So any financial product, whether it's lending to pay out an interest rate, derivatives, insurance, all of those are completely reliant on an Oracle for an input in order to come into existence. So I think all of DeFi, once you go past exchanges and tokens, 
is going to be completely dependent on an Oracle mechanism providing them high quality data. So I think it's I think it's all of DeFi. How DeFi will evolve, I think that'll depend on two factors. One factor will be how quickly DeFi can convert the mainstream in a stable economy. So in a stable economy, like the one we've been experiencing so far, the question is how can decentralized financial products that provide a superior rate of return or superior security guarantees, which some people people care about, or, or a superior new product that maybe the traditional financial system doesn't know how to make or can't make, how, how do those financial products made by these highly creative startups in this permissionless kind of model make their way to consumers? And the part of the issue there is that in order to use DeFi right now, you need to have tokens. DeFi right now relates to a specific type of asset, specific type of collateral being put inside of it, which is essentially a token, which is essentially all these cryptocurrencies. So I think, I think the real question is, in, in a stable economy, what percentage of random, normal retail or just standard people make their way into the cryptocurrency landscape? And then what percentage of the people that own tokens make their way into being DeFi users? And in that sense, if you look at DeFi right now as a market that's approaching $5 billion in total value locked, and you look at the size of the, of the cryptocurrency um, space and the amount of token value that could be put into DeFi at like 350 or, or, or more billion, it's a very small percentage. Even in a stable economy, the percentage of tokens or the percentage of value that is possible to put into DeFi is right now very low. And the percentage of total value that could be in a cryptocurrency format, whether that's stable coins or some other, um, some other token, is also very low. So in that sense, I think the shift of the normal person's percentage of value being in cryptocurrency, and then the shift of what percentage of all cryptocurrency value is locked in DeFi, those are the normal natural shifts that will occur in a stable uh, economy. Unfortunately for us and, and the world, the economy even though, in my opinion, even though it appears stable, is probably not very, very stable in, um, in reality. And I think that the, the second scenario, which is possible, is that the, the guarantees of the financial system begin to wear at the edges and then gradually begin to collapse inwards. And the way that this looks, in my opinion, is that the what what i call the brand based guarantees the brand based promises that financial institutions give to people about their ownership of an asset their ability to trade something their ability to have access to their wealth in a certain format their ability to have an interest rate in order to combat inflation for their holdings if the institutions or the entities that are responsible for providing those promises begin to fail in a sufficiently large amount in a sufficiently fast time series, you basically arrive at a place where I think people or a large percentage of people will lose faith in what I call brand-based agreements. In that world, the alternative that people would have is what I call math-based or for this audience, I guess, cryptographically guaranteed contracts or smart contracts, right? So you, you basically have people that for many years were promised that a certain brand would protect the value that they work for, give them a rate of interest, allow them to trade, allow them to have ownership of something of value, whether that's bank accounts or trading infrastructure or interest-bearing accounts. And I think we're already starting to slowly see some of those guarantees going away. We haven't seen the institutions or the places that provide those guarantees have significant structural issues. But I think the second scenario for, for DeFi is the world changing scenario and the world changing scenario is the one where the existing financial infrastructure out there no longer meets people's requirements because the faith that people have in what i call brand based guarantees has uh, evaporated and then the only alternative that people will have is math based guarantees because when you've seen a bunch of things that you thought could never fail or could never stop functioning properly, suddenly stop functioning properly, and somebody comes to you and says, hey, I have a great brand-based guarantee. My brand won't fail. My brand's going to be fine. Don't worry. You're not really inclined to believe that. 
you are inclined to believe that when everything's going great and there isn't a single failure and everybody's solvent and everybody's uh, checking account infrastructure is working properly and interest is being paid out to combat in inflation and you know, you're not worried about it. But I think there's a distinct possibility that we could be going towards a world where there is a shock like that. And that shock would immediately make people realize the actual nature of their relationship to their assets, to their counterparty risk, and to their various um, other risks in the traditional financial system. And I think right about now is when DeFi and these math-based smart contracts would be ready to provide them a better alternative. And, and even now you see that to a certain degree with some of the interest that certain DeFi products are willing to pay out in a very, very low interest environment. And you're seeing kind of early adopters looking at that and saying, well, why am I keeping my funds in some kind of you know, traditional financial system when I can get 4% or 5% or 8% in this parallel decentralized financial system? And granted, right now it's early adopters, but that's because I think there hasn't been a sufficiently large shock to the system. So that second scenario is, is, is a very rapid world-changing scenario that I think is a distinct possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very crisp explanation. My last question I have is uh, overall, like when you think about developers and founders who are not today in crypto, and specifically with DeFi growing so much, but yet I would say is not really widely understood from the outside, what's your pitch for these people? Should they get involved? And if yes, why? I think people should generally think about why they're working on a certain body of work. Partly because life is uh, life is very short and you should do something worthwhile. And partly because working on something that you don't care about is very painful. I, I personally don't do it. And I'm, I'm absolutely lucky, unbelievably lucky and extremely grateful that I have the privilege to work on something this important with an amazing community like we have and all, all the other great people on our team that we're working together with. So I, I think that the first thing I would tell them is that if you're a smart developer that wants to, to build the future of decentralized financial products, you should contact us at Chainlink. That's definitely the first thing I would tell them. The second thing I would tell them is I think anybody getting into this space should be prepared for a few things. They should be prepared for a lot of misinformation. They should be prepared for some weird behavior from certain members of the cryptocurrency community, but at the same time, a real, a very real devotion and ideological belief from a much greater group of people. And I, I think that if someone can find a personal meaning in how blockchains and smart contracts and this infrastructure will change the nature of agreements between people. Like that's that's the personal meaning that I find in this. I find it amazing that there are places on the planet still that can't have basic agreements happen like insurance or, or certain um, interest bearing financial products to help people combat inflation. With all the advancements that we have, there are still people that can't get insurance against weather events to keep their farm going. And there's places where people can't get a savings account to keep the value of what they work for intact instead of having it eroded by inflation. And I think solving, solving that through the creation of a parallel technologically enforced legal system instead of a brand-based and people-based legal system, or at least solving that to some meaningful degree, is a worthwhile body of work to spend your time and your energy on. Uh, anybody joining this space, I, I think if they can find personal meaning in creating this, this different world, then they should very, very seriously look at being part of this space because I think it's, it's one of the few spaces in technology that, in my opinion, is not trivial. It is not about some trivial incremental improvement to some small you know, incremental improvement on, on how people consume some good or something. It is something that can create, and in my opinion, will create a fundamental shift in how both the developed world's markets and contracts function, and very importantly, how the emerging markets, and therefore that the majority of the world's population is able to come to agreement with each other, which is an extremely powerful thing because when people can come to agreement properly is when society really shines and you have uh, people being able to pursue their economic destiny and have fair economic relationships with each other which is really to a large degree what human society is about. It's about having fair economic relationships with each other. 
in addition to all the cool things we make, like our art philosophy. So I, I would say that people should find personal, some kind of personal meaning in what they're working on, regardless of the space they go into. Uh, I think I briefly talked about a template about how people can find personal meaning in working on this in our space. I think that people should be prepared for ups and downs in our industry because our industry deals with all kinds of different dynamics that a lot of other industries don't deal with. They, they should be prepared for all kinds of uh, strange behavior from certain people in the industry. They should be prepared for a lot of devoted and committed people to really, really care that something gets built and works a certain way. And I think those two things are, are what people should, um, should really keep in mind. And then the final question I think that they should ask themselves, which is also a very important question, is their focus. I, I think it's very important to have focus. And this is why we don't make decentralized financial products, even though we could make them very well working with banks and working with 50 other DeFi pro companies and teams, we don't make them and we won't make them. And why we don't make a blockchain, even though we could make a blockchain, but we don't and we won't. We, we don't want to make a layer one chain. So even in infrastructure, we, for example, have made a concrete decision about where we're going to focus. I do see a number of people coming into the space and getting mesmerized by a few ideas simultaneously, which leads to a lack of focus. I see them basically saying, I'm going to make a great decentralized financial product and I'm going to make some kind of infrastructure, whether that's the creation of a chain or whether that's the creation of an Oracle mechanism. But I think it's very important for people to keep this idea of focus in mind, no matter what space they go into. But if they come into our space, I think they're going to have to have, make a fundamental decision. And my advice to them is to make it sooner rather than later, because the resources they'll expend by not making it will be, a, will be large and much larger than they assume. They should decide, am I building uh, an application, a smart contract, a use case that's going to run on, on this infrastructure, or am I going to build infrastructure? Am I going to build a layer one blockchain? Am I going to build an Oracle? Am I, what, am I going to build some kind of infrastructure? And the reality is that building the infrastructure is something that you need real academic horsepower to do. You need cryptography experts. You need security experts. You need millions of dollars for audits if you're going to do it properly. And so it's an endeavor that people should take on understanding the costs and the, the serious risks that go into building any kind of infrastructure, much less secure infrastructure, much less decentralized secure infrastructure. But the teams that I see going into our space, and even with a limited resource set of developers and engineering time, going and making a high quality decentralized financial product, using the infrastructure that has already been built by other teams of 40, 50, many more people, and leveraging all of that infrastructure to create uh, truly unique and new financial products that all of these tokens that rolled in during the 2017 boom now want to be put into, I see that those people have a real opportunity as far as a large and increasing group of private key holders that want to put value into their application. And that, that group of private key holders and cryptocurrency owners is going to grow. So I, I really see that as an opportunity that, in my opinion, people should focus on if, if they have a resource constrained team of three to five you know, developers and, and they want to really win at something, I think they can win at making decentralized financial products. And I think there's, there's a lot of infrastructure already available that's backed by high quality teams that's going to continue improving to allow them to build those applications. And really, we as a space need people to do that. So I think people that build these next generation decentralized financial products will find a very receptive and uh, excited community that'll be grateful for them coming in and building these, this next generation of, of smart contracts. And, and we'll be very grateful to them too, because these are really the people who are going to redefine the whole industry and show the value of decentralized infrastructure that we ourselves are working on and you're working on. And so I think the industry really needs an influx of smart, high quality teams that are going to continue to build decentralized financial products that form the use cases that the infrastructure then makes possible. And uh, my advice would be to either either immediately come work at uh, Chainlink if you want to build uh, infrastructure and especially Oracle-related infrastructure. That's obviously my first piece of advice. And then uh, the subsequent piece of advice is about caring. And then finally, if, if you want to build your own thing, I think building a DeFi smart contract using existing infrastructure is, is probably a good direction to go in. Awesome. 
Well, this is a really good explanation, I think, for people how to think about the space. Well, thanks a lot. Thank you for joining Building the Open Web. Yep, my pleasure, Sash. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. You can find more episodes of this podcast at openwebcollective.com. If your founder are looking for help with product, go to market or fundraise, apply on the same exact website. It's openwebcollective.com. If you really like this episode, I would really appreciate if you give us a review on a platform of choice where you listen to podcasts too. And finally, if you're on Twitter, we are at openwebfounders. Again, the handle is at openwebfounders. I'll see you next week.